In this video, we're going to discuss demonology, hearing scenarios from North India. And you should probably read the chapter first, as I'm going to just hit a few highlights. Uh, first, local healers in Hindu North India. In this area, the spirits that are the problem are called prets and boots, P-R-E-T-S and B-H-U-T-S. And these are thought to be spirits or ghosts of the dead that are still hanging around for some reason. Uh, perhaps it may be the spirit of a woman who's died in childbirth uh, and they simply refuse to leave their child. Uh, it may be a spirit that did not enjoy a proper funeral ceremony. And for that reason, they're still sort of stuck in the land of the living, so to speak. It's said that the Hindus particularly fear these spirits or the ghost of Muslims as they think that they're aggressive and violent uh, and so forth. Of course, the Muslims feel the same way about Hindu spirits. We see a little ethnocentrism here. There are a few three basic reasons why these spirits are thought to harm people, afflict them, make them sick. Uh, number one is thought that they're simply hungry and thirsty. After all, they're not in the land of the ancestors, uh, so they're not privy to uh, sacrificial gestures and other offerings. And it is said that they will actually enter the victim's body and just uh, consume them from the inside. They literally feed off the living. Secondly, it's thought that some of these spirits are individuals who, for some reason, were frustrated during their lifetime. Perhaps it might be a barren woman who, in her anger, is forcing other women to be barren. I think he also, Kinsley also mentions a person who is sexually frustrated might take over someone's body and engage in promiscuous sexual behavior and so forth. And then thirdly, some of these spirits, these boots and prets, attempt to right wrongs that have been done to them or settle grudges. And they will work through individuals. The healers in this culture undergo a, a training that can last uh, several years. And it's said that the healer will establish a rapport with some sort of spirit that will help them in their healing. And in, in a typical uh, shamanic way, they do enter a trance state. And in this trance state, their helper spirit comes to them and basically interacts with the offending boot or pret. And the first step apparently is coaxing the possessing spirit to identify itself, which at that point gives them control over it. And then their helper spirit or their patron spirit uh, may then send the spirit to some material object, which can then be destroyed, or maybe, his, or maybe the helper spirit will simply imprison the offending spirit. Either way, what we're talking about here basically is an exorcism. So once again, we see spirit interference in this world and some sort of exorcism as healing. Next, Kinsley discusses the Pasak Makan. This is a place where if you've got particularly troublesome cases, individuals will be taken to uh, this place particular place. It's around Varanasi, which is in northern India, one of the most sacred cities of Hinduism. And basically translated, it means the place where demons get liberated. And it is said that the, the really important Hindu god Shiva actually freed a demon from bondage at this place. And since that time, the, the healing place, Basak Makan, has been basically under the control of this demon who has been sort of transformed into a benevolent force for healing. 
And as you read, uh, people will visit Pasak Makan with all sorts of issues. Uh, they may even be financial, legal, uh, could be mental problems, etc. Et a variety of maladies, but in almost every case the diagnosis is demon possession or possession by some unwanted spirit. There are three primary actors in the healing process. Of course there's the patient, the afflicted person. There's the traditional healer who uses various shamanic techniques. And then there's a Brahmin priest. A Brahmin priest uh, is a priest of Hinduism who can read the Vedas, ancient religious scriptures, in the original Sanskrit. And in the Hindu context, it's thought that the actual sounds have power. So clearly, the Brahmin priest uh, is, is an essential part of this healing process. One ritual, healing ritual, involves something like a funeral ceremony. The idea here, of course, is to move the spirit on to the next world. There's also another part of the healing ritual that occurs. Uh, at some point, the patient will give a piece of their clothing to the priest and the priest and the healer, and they will actually invoke the demon and send it to that piece of clothing and then nail it to an old tree. So a form of transference and capture. And you can see a picture of that on page 66. And finally, in northern India, there's the Balaji Temple. Balaji is just another term for Hanuman, which is the famous monkey god of Hinduism that you read about in the Ramayana epic. And it is thought that it was actually Hanuman himself. And by the way, in Hinduism, all of the various gods are simply thought to be manifestations of the one true god, Brahman. Anyway, it's thought that Hanuman, or Balaji, actually built this temple and blessed it himself as a place for humans to receive help but also demons to receive help as well. During healing the at the Balaji temple the patient will go into a trance uh, referred to as Peshi P-E-S-P-E-S-H-I -E Peshi and the demon will manifest itself at that point. Of course you read that uh, the demon must manifest itself and identify itself otherwise it can't be controlled or exercised. We've seen that's a common element uh, even in Western cultures. During the uh, Pesci trance state the individual will often manifest behavior that is a staple of so-called demon possession movies here in the West they'll curse and, and shout and strike out at people etc. Clearly there are some issues being dealt with here. I highly doubt it has anything to do with the possessing spirit uh, but they are suffering from some affliction and this is apparently one way they're attempting to deal with it. If you think about it, it's a it's a safe place. It's a place where a person can safely manifest these antisocial behaviors uh, it's um, the Pesci is almost a safety valve, so to speak, uh, for a person who needs to release some tension. It's thought that the individual's family and community are ashamed of the behavior that the individual might be manifesting. Uh, perhaps they're sexually promiscuous, they're behaving immorally in some sort of way, uh, and it's said that that the family has to own up to the fact that they themselves are perhaps partially responsible for the condition of the patient. And as Kinsley writes, together the patient and his family work to restore normality, to strengthen the true self of the patient, which longs to be rid of debilitating, polluting, and alienating behavior. So it's, it's actually by bringing the family together along with the afflicted person that healing eventually seems to occur. Uh, because look what's happened here. Number one, the individual has a safe place to manifest 
uh, whatever psychological tension, psychological issues they're having. And then number two, they have the support of the healer, the priest, and the family. Uh, everyone comes together, once again, airs grievances. We've heard that before. And not surprisingly, healing is eventually accomplished. Now, once again, I think it's quite clear that we're dealing with psychotherapeutic healing. That there, there are no possessing spirits here, I'm quite sure. Uh, the individual perhaps has some psychological issues, but what we have here is something akin to uh, a very elaborate group therapy. And so psychotherapeutic healing does occur.